Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Give a give it a few more minutes. To let some more people join, and you can all sit and enjoy the uh, the eye candy that you have here with Mr. Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's got a point. How you doing, Maria? Mike? Ain't too bad yourself there, David. Welcome from the great state of Atlanta, uh, great state of Georgia. And New Jersey. Can't forget about New Jersey. Give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Mm -hmm. We want as many people to get these insights from, from Sheldon as humanly possible so we can all improve our, our supplier relationships. We'll get more or less and uh, understand how the relationship layer can make us better uh, partners for our better, better people, yeah. Better people. <laughs> this goes deep. It, it does. <laughs> New York and New Jersey. All right, tri-state area. Wonderful. Somebody from North Carolina. I see. We'll ignore the Philly guy. He's probably an Eagles fan. Hello, Houston. Oh. Can we kick Craig out? We don't want any Eagles fans huh. here. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. All right. We're at uh, 19. Let's get, see if we can get one more before we start. I think there'll be people trickling in as we go, right? Very likely. I would have thought so. So... Welcome everyone to our series um, on supply relationship management um, on behalf of ISM New Jersey uh, and myself and the board of directors. We want to welcome you to Calling All Relationships, where um, we talk about um, and we try to define and build uh, your knowledge, my knowledge, all of our knowledge uh, with wonderful speaker um, Sheldon, my dad, he's the CEO of Sapico. Um, and in our last discussion, which is a couple of months back now, we talked about the value um, and the fundamental aspects of supplier relationship management, everything from data and spend visibility to supplier categorization and collaboration and performance risk management. Um, and we, we kind of wrapped that discussion all around, you know, what is the relationship you have with the supplier? Is it your contract terms? Is that the end goal? Is that the be all and end all of your supplier relationship? Or is there more to it? We as procurement folks know that at the very least, we expect a supplier to live up to what they signed up for in a contract. But we often have stakeholders who expect more, who ask for more. And in order for us to get that, in order for us to get that innovation and that true partnership from our supplier, we have to build the right relationships. Well, how do you do that? Sheldon is going to talk to us about the relationship layer that he and his organization and the platform that they've created help to define um, and how the, we can use that uh, platform for real world applications and some of the results that he's seen in his in his work. So welcome to part two of calling all relationships, defining the relationship layer. Let's talk uh, with Mr. Sheldon. How you doing, Sheldon? Another amazing introduction. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm uh, doing good. I'm very, very good. It's warm here still. Uh, I think summer's just about to end. Uh, we had a couple of days of good weather, but that's about our lot over here, as, as you know, in good old Blighty. Um, it's quiet here. My kids and my wife are off on holiday. Um, really quiet. Two, no six-year-old twins. 
going crazy. Um, so if we get a disturbance, it will be Amazon. Um, other than that, we're good to go. Um, so what, what I want to do is straight away share some slides as a, as a, as a backdrop um, to the call. Um, so let me just bring those up. Can you see my slides, guys? David? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, just as a backdrop uh, to our conversation, uh, here we are, series two, defining the relationship layer. What is the relationship layer? We're going to go into that in some detail. Um, this isn't about demoing the digital platform. It's about talking about the mechanics of what's involved in creating um, a, a structure that we can execute reliably within. So relationships are like any relationships. If they don't have boundaries and they don't have structures, they become dysfunctional. They are absolutely no different to our personal relationships. So all this started, just going back a bit, all this started early 80s, <coughs> Peter Crouchy, McKinsey consultant, um, wrote a really well-known piece in, in uh, Harvard Business Review uh, that, that talked about the steps that we need to take to become more proactive in managing our suppliers. Now, I mean, it says up here, relationship, supply relationship management. Um, and, and, you, you know, at, 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 a, at the first glance, this is what managing your suppliers is about, okay? Evaluating the, uh, your vendor's performance, determining the level of their contribution to your overall success and developing strategies to progress. Absolutely right, still good today. The challenge was relationship. Relationship management was a very, very loosely, it was a very loose term back then because supply chains were invariably seen as overheads. They, I mean, they still are largely seen as overheads. And, and as is the case with any overheads, the emphasis is going to be on driving costs down. And contracts were typically let and managed by traditional purist procurement function. And the, their raison d'etre, if you like, was again, driving costs down. I, I mean, I can't, the, I, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just, I can't fathom in 1983, what it would look like to manage a complex supply chain, right? So you think about the supply chain that we have right now, right? Mm -hmm. It's one supplier that supplies one thing and then he's got 10 suppliers that supply another thing to him. And then there's 10 other suppliers. Like in 1983, there wasn't even Microsoft Excel. No, what it does wasn't. that, like, I mean, that's gotta be insane to manage yeah. that kind of a, a, a supplier relationship. Yeah, wow. and we're going to we're going to get into that in a lot more detail as well. Um, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. Um, it it was a it, it was an activity that that largely ended uh, or, or resulted in a very adversarial, attritional type relationship, um, often resulting in uh, in in dispute. Um, and I, I I am sorry to interrupt. Let's I I'm just go ahead. I'm just. You're very informative, and it makes my mind go into different places. So go ahead, chill. <laughs> okay. Is it? Are you? Are you saying something else, or no. carry on? Okay, Please. cool. You carry. You you interrupt whenever you want because it's all good stuff. Okay, so you know, early attempts at, at driving, implementing SRM failed. Okay, almost without exception, they failed. Okay, because there was no structure to it. Everything was very cost driven. You got these two big kind of protagonists, you know, procurement spend management and and the overhead that you know that was the the supply chain um so that's all about driving driving costs down uh, and then you've got this kind of srm discipline that's trying to that's focusing on 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 you know longevity and maturity and 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 quite frankly it was deferred every every single time in favor of a quicker more addressable win okay yeah. uh, and 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 that's that's pretty much the way it was for for some time um, so 
what followed was was years in the wilderness. Okay, there wasn't any tech. There wasn't any tech to do this. Um, it was Excel, as you say, Excel spreadsheets, uh, non-scalable, non-repeatable processes, um, and, and and a very binary approach uh, to driving um, cost-based models. So 40 years, very, very slowly evolving SRM. Okay, it's only in the last four that we've really been paying attention, to be honest with you. Um, and we've had, you know, there's been, there's been disruption long before COVID came along, but nothing was, uh, <laughs> nothing made us sit up and listen, okay? Uh, the gaps between disruptions were always sufficient to drive the market, okay? Uh, and to, to, to reinforce the status quo. Okay, it was only when COVID happened that things really did start, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the wheels really did start to come off because those gaps that drove the market before had disappeared. Everything stopped for, for the duration. Um, and so it was during COVID that, that every analyst out there from, McCart from, from McKinsey to, to Gartner, Hackett Group, Forrester, et cetera, they're all saying the same thing. They're all sending the same messaging. Procurement supply chain professionals need to invest heavily in, into relationship-driven resilience. Some might say it's too late. It was too, it was too late. Um, you know the resilience was building. You see McKinsey reports. You know COVID COVID uh, sorry disruption curves decades before COVID came along. Um, but that's the thing that made the difference because suddenly we need to do something different. The contracts that we've got in place, they're not fit for purpose. They don't, we, you, there's no contingency to be had for something that's that's potentially a, a, a change, a baselining, a rebaselining a, a re of the way we do things on an ongoing basis. Um, so things weren't fit for purpose. There was a, a, a need to really do things differently and all that talk about new norm and et cetera, et cetera, um, about a year or so back. Um, and, you know, I've had, conversations with so many CPOs over the years, uh, more so recently, and they've all said the same thing uh, with, with, uh, with, the, with the, the advent of so much more attention around driving better relationships and relationship-driven resilience. And they've all said the same thing. We've seen SRM systems, but none of them do relationships. They're all KPI dashboards. And, and this is such a great point that you bring here, right? You think about your average QBR, Right. We sit there as procurement people and we sit there and we watch the vendor come in and they show us all these slides about how they've met their, you know, all the little green dots and all the green lines that say mm. you met all our ticket counts and all of that stuff. Right. And this is mm -hmm. what the basis for most SRM programs, not just SRM systems, most SRM programs are. It's just, yeah, you're doing what you said you do. And here are the KPIs to prove. Yeah. It. Yeah. And then right after that, these are how many invoices you guys haven't paid. But there's so much more to that. That's absolutely right. And there's so you know, you've just you just nailed it. These are your, these are your KPIs. These these are your greens. These are your reds. These are your ninety nine percent, et cetera, et cetera. There's no narrative. So what is the relationship layer? So uh, you know, when you first look at first glance, the relationship layer talks about you know the interactions between the different entities of the ecosystem, you know, customers, suppliers, manufacturers, etc. But when you take a closer look, it actually starts to take on a slightly different meaning. Okay, so we're not talking about the, uh, the systemic data, okay, the ones and zeros. We're not talking about the logistical functions and the cooperation between the logistical functions. And the front. It's not about that at all. This is a broader definition of supply chain management it's higher up in the machinery. It's the unstructured data. It's the collaborative approach to engaging across multiple, mul multiple parties and multiple disciplines. It's the unstructured data layer. The challenge is when we look at that unstructured data layer, we as humans don't live within, we don't live within the contract. We don't live in a, legal, in a legally drafted contract where everything works the clause. We operate in the real world where things don't necessarily go to plan. 
on a regular basis. Things don't happen, uh, you know, in, in a highly subjective operational environment. And, and this links in very importantly, these statistics, 70% of organizations fail in their digital transformation strategies. 90% of organizations fail to execute in the strategic objectives generally. Now you might think, what's this got to do with, with, with digital transformation? I'll explain. But let me, before I get to that, I, I will say this, okay. 80%, up to 80% of, a, of an organization's revenue lives outside its borders within its supply chain, within its suppliers. That's what it's got to do with digital transformation. And you'll get more as we go through the slides. So the, the, the challenge is, okay, the, the problems with digital transformation, with executing on objectives, and that's where it ties into the relationship layer, by the way, the execution of objectives, okay? The problems aren't rooted down in the systemic data. They're not rooted down into the cooperative, you know, cooperating logistical functions. Big challenges, but not insurmountable. The problems, the root, as it says down here, they live higher up in the non-systemic, holy grail, if you like, of the unstructured data layer, where the people are. So, I mean, I think, I think the, 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 the example of a digital transformation is a good one, right? It's a highly complex, multifunction, inclusive um, set of activities that don't exist in silos, right? You need people from finance and legal and, and procurement and tech yeah. and all of this. All these people have to get together, right? Yeah. Um, and they fail so often because that the that complex kind of ecosystem is not able to right they're not so here, able to so reach alignment and uh, agree roles and responsibilities etc cetera, etc cetera. so take uh, so exactly as it says there what are the most challenging issues in digital transformation where are they rooted reaching alignment yeah. agreeing roles and responsibilities agree, agreeing which battles culture mapping priorities drivers unifying autonomy Timing, deadlines, budget, agreeing what to measure, trans, uh, um, translation, different languages, uh, ability to course correct, silo thinking, change of version, all these different things. And where do they all sit within the relationship layer? So how do we, how do <coughs> we take this wide and varied group of people <clears throat> and realign it so that we have a meaningful relationship layer, right? So if you think about it, when we working as procurement folks, mm. we're sometimes the hub of this this wheel. We're the liaison with finance. We're the liaison with legal. We're the liaison mm -hmm. with tech, right? How do we build a meaningful relationship layer with us as the center? So procurement are often the facilitators or the liaisons. Um, because they, they, you know, they 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 let the contracts. Um, they are involved in, you know, sometimes more or less degrees um, beyond that. Um, but I think procurement are very clear now that that they need to have a more active role in facilitating relationships. You know, these contracts are not there. The contracts that we have with our supply chain partners, suppliers. They're not there to service procurement. They're there to service the business. That's procurement are, they're almost the custodians and the facilitators. But the very value of those contracts that those contracts bring, the reason they're there is to service the business. So it's very, very important to create a relationship layer that, uh, that encompasses the entire community or, or different communities around the ecosystem. And that's not just customer side, that's supplier side, of course, because as I've said, 80% of revenue generated outside our borders means that we have to bring everybody together into the same page. Uh, a meaningful kind of execution. Look, I'm not gonna run through every single one of these now. Uh, this, this debt is to be shared as well, um, mm -hmm. if anybody wants a copy, by the way. Um, so let's let's talk about the elements that oh there we go <laughs> of building a relationship right we're we're, yeah. we're starting our SRM program from scratch 
yeah. hypothetically, right? We've lived as procurement people, as the hub. That's yeah. so, but we want to make this a more, not necessarily formal, but a more effective relationship thing. What are the elements that we we need to put together? Right. So we're build, we're we're starting to build the picture now. Okay, we've gone through the history, uh, and we've and uh, we've come we've 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 come through into a period where <clears throat> it's recognised that relationships are not just the nice to have; they are an existential component of these of these business engagements okay so what does that mean in reality because these these engagements are, are often very big engagements and and the way things are nowadays with with global non-stop operations as you'll see in this deck they can't be done without technology okay so we need to look at how to break down what are the components um the elements of the relationship layer so the relationship layer is we've named it four pillars okay uh, and and we think that it it follows uh, quite a logical, uh, a, a logical process. Okay, so we say that it doesn't matter what you're buying or what you're selling or how much of it or where it's from or to. They can be split into four main categories or pillars of engagement, and this is what they look like. So the first one is called the relationship lens. Okay, so this typically focuses on the qualities that you can see: commitment, communication, trust, flexibility, alignment. Uh, objective setting, for example. Um, so then you have the commercial lens, typically focuses on your commercial, financial, maybe procurement activity, uh, reduction TCO, different activities, you know, in, uh, aspects of invoicing, efficiency, as you mentioned earlier on as well, uh, and spend management. Uh, and these are just examples, okay? Uh, the project lens um, or pillar uh, focuses on quality, environmental standards, uh, product process quality, security products. Um, and, and I'll give some examples of how these are used as well. And the service lens focuses on uh, different aspects of project and service delivery, efficiency, life cycle, SLA compliance, performance management. And this is a sample of one of these. Uh, so this is what it looks like. These are the four pillars at the top. Um, these are the uh, examples that I just gave, uh, and there are you can create as many of these as you want, depending on the type of relationship. There. So each of your suppliers will will have a different nuance to it, or a different set of circumstances. Uh, this is one that's been used in the construction industry, and you can see that there are a number of different headings that have been created. But we'll say at this point that every single one. Of the, this is what we call a control panel, but in the relationship layer, where you can create as many of these headings as you want. And each single one of these headings represents a workspace um, where a community of the entire community can come together to work. I'll show you more on that in a minute. Here's another sample. <laughs> this one's related to COVID impact. So this was actually used to. Um, so let's let's. I mean, because COVID is still fresh in everybody's mind. Let's take this back to a real world example, right? Yeah. Hypothetical situation. We've got your idea of these four pillars, right? And I'm engaging one of my managed service providers, right? I want to understand the relationship. I want to understand the commercial. Um, I want to understand all the projects that they're, they're involved with across my organization. Um, and what kind of services, what's their their collaboration posture like? What do they look like for us? Do you have a real world example, like a use case that you can share with us? Like how did this, from from start to finish, how did you build this out? Not well, necessarily. This, so this uh, particular sample was actually based on a, uh, on a real world example uh, for one of our customers uh, and a service desk um, that they operated. Um, which was struck very heavily by COVID um, because the service, the the, the call centres, um, both two national call centres, both um, had exa had cases of COVID uh, and had to close overnight um, okay. with the entire workforce having to be sent home to work because the call centre needed to keep operating. It was a national call center um and so there were a number of different 
Um, this is the work from home, work from home governance impacts down here so in the service pillar, uh, hardware reports, because there was a there was a need to get hardware and software set up and get it approved double time, okay? Um, so you'll see a number of different examples. So the, the, these were work areas that were set up and in, within each one of them, there were different uh, leadership teams, there were different KPI metrics and barometers that were set up so they could actually measure um, and keep track of process of, of progress within e each one of these different areas. Um, so over in here, I think you can see uh, client service impacts one and two. This refers to different regions one and two, uh, different impacts to regions three and four. So uh, business failure mitigation plans, the whole range of different, because obviously COVID had such a huge effect on our businesses because they had to shut. And if they didn't shut, they had to be moved off campus entirely into the safety of our own homes. And obviously we saw how much digital transformation took place in the space of months. Um, they were saying that six or seven years worth of digital transformation took place in the space of two months. Uh, at Interestingly one enough, I had a very similar experience, right? We had um, an ERP support organization uh, based in Pune and within a month I had to get all of these people who were in a centralized network operation center with access to highly sensitive corporate data mm. working out of their houses. Exactly uh, my point. That's exactly exactly <laughs> the same situation. Um, and it was a third party and I didn't have a dedicated SRM program in place. So the relationship layer was defined and lived strictly based off of our statement of work and our contract. Yes. Um, so rather than finding myself in a position with a partner who was uh, amicable and easy to deal with, they were challenged by us and then we were pushing them to get a result. Um, a quick question for you, question for you. So your, that contract, that statement of work, did it, did it have provision? Did the contract have provision for having to send the workforce home to work? Absolutely not. I was paying for butts and seats, butts and seats yeah. in an operation center, which I was also paying for space for yeah so now i had to take that and translate that to ensure that these people had adequate internet at their house to be available during their work hours yeah. um and fortunately because i inherited this this contract and the relationship i made the effort early on to start building rapport with our sales team and their leadership so mm. it went from a um not necessarily an adversarial relationship, but one that was just paper. It was very transactional. Mm -hmm. And we were working towards building a much more strategic relationship. So they had long-term plans. They had roadmaps. They had access to key stakeholders because of my interaction and integration into the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but again, this was a, a, a very heavy lift that could have been made much better if the relationship layer was more defined and better nurtured so interestingly so the the snippet that you're looking at on the screen is only a snippet of the entire uh, environment that was created um and as i said there was no contract in place well there was a contract but it was it just didn't cover the reality at all uh, and and it was a complete rebaselining exercise it, it was more than contingency um so they fell back on the relationship layer within the platform to create guidelines, to create swim lanes and guidelines um, because they had nothing else to use. Just, just a quick show of hands. Um, how many of you guys had similar situations during COVID? Just quickly raise your hand. Um, either data centers, contract manufacturers, or, uh, uh, call centers, customer service centers that you had to quickly adjust or pivot your your digital strategies to 
to uh, accommodate. Just show of hands, reaction. Give me an emoji in the in the chat. Something. I'm sorry to hear that, Karen. It's also fair to say that a lot of organizations carried on with the COVID excuse, <laughs> call it an excuse, the COVID explanation for why their services were, why they, why they were seeking SLA lets, et cetera, long after um, the immediate bow wave of COVID. Wow. Do you see what I mean by that? So, so a lot of companies, you you call up a call center and you and you get the emergency messaging to tell you that the that, that their services are uh, obviously running on a on, on a on a on a you know skeleton service or something like that, um, and that continued for way way long after COVID had the the the, the main part of COVID had uh, had relented. Um, but yeah, so anyway, um, just getting back on track. So in terms of digital transformation and SRM, this is the, the, the statistic that we were talking about. And, and absolutely, this includes um, SRM as a part of digital, digital transformation. How could it not be? Just look at your typical nonstop operation. This is what they look like. This is what we're dealing with. One territory wakes up, another goes to sleep. Globally distributed teams, more now than ever, obviously, uh, although there's some, some change going on there, as we know. Uh, remote functions, multiple service lines, multiple operations, time zones, languages. And that's just the customer. Now overlay the supplier ecosystem and all its interactions. It's a hell of a thing. So with the, with the relationship layer, which will all become very, very clear on a demo, to be honest with you, or a tour of the platform, which I know we're not doing today, um, you, you'll, you'll see how the whole thing comes to life because it, it really is a, 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 a quite a thing to bring the relationship layer to life um, and, and to enable so much real-time truly collaborative activity um, and automated response it, it just it just lights up i mean david you've seen it anyway um mm -hmm. it's um living it in real life is um is often a challenge right we mm. talk about like i love this concept of the four pillars right you the, the way that you look at your supplier relationship is not just the document that you you live at because your supplier is supposed to be your partner right your mm -hmm. partner is supposed to make you better at what you do and your supplier is your supplier because you think they have this capability to do everything that you've contracted them for but you also expect them to have the knowledge and the experience to take your process your function to the next level mm. that's what you're hoping for when you when you build out a relationship with a, a a service provider with a piece of software you want that software to be innovative to make what you do easier you want that service to be better over time year one it's okay year two it's awesome year three it's amazing and then year four five and six it continues to evolve but that doesn't happen if your relationship layer isn't foundationally sound. It doesn't happen if you are not looking at these four pillars correctly. Is that correct? Is that right? I think that collaboration, let's look at collaboration in a relationship. Um, you, you, you start a new relationship with a supplier. Um, you get to know each other. You go through that period of getting to know each other and you can start to collaborate. You don't start collaborating straight away. You've got to kind of get into your, the group. Um, and, and then collaboration almost becomes an asset, okay? Because if you, because it can 
it can deliver so much more value if you can if you get to, if you get into a position where you can collaborate with your partners really 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 well but then what happens is over the course of time um they start to become a little bit stale um collaboration can go off uh, a few bad habits creep in and maybe the odd dispute maybe this maybe that different different uh different things start to affect how how well oiled the machinery is um and collaboration is it, it's kind of like a it's like an asset or like, like an amortizing asset you know so it kind of degrades in value over the course of its life until you relet the contract with somebody else and off you go again um and, and and that that's statistically what happens okay so if you if you have a mechanism that can keep constantly shaking things up by driving, uh, by creating this infrastructure, and then by, uh, and this is where these next few slides is quite quite handy, okay? Because th these next few slides talk about the, me the mechanics of the relationship layer the, of the framework, okay? So the first one is obviously the overrider on four pillars, which is this configurable infrastructure. So everything we looked at is completely configurable for any type of engagement. Uh, from manufacturing, obviously we work in the aerospace and defense sector, so um, th that includes electronics and manufacturing, uh, even recruitment suppliers as well, RPOs. Uh, we work in uh, the FMCG industry as well, merchandise, um, and so you've got any number of different um, use cases built into, into four pillars, into the relationship layer, because you can bespoke it and customize it how you want. So that's number one. Number two is the fact that everything is actionable within the relationship layer, okay? This is really, really key, okay? It's not about creating static, more static spreadsheets, as we said at the beginning. This is not about putting what we did before online, because who wants to do that? As you said, it's about I think, making I think this makes, this makes so much sense, because so much of the relationship layer is not necessarily based on fact. It's based on feeling. Right? Yeah. You've got some executive who's didn't get an email answered and he's like, I feel like they're not responsive, you know, or something like that. And and having visibility deep into the the supply chain or the relationship or however it is, um, makes it far more um provable. Well, this is a digital platform, okay? It, you can do things in an actionable way if you're not taking advantage of the of what digitalization gives you, then you're missing an opportunity. Because, you know, just on this one alone, I mean, McKinsey did a study that, that, that showed that digital platforms such as ours can drive an additional three to 10% incrementally on an annual basis just by reducing, radically reducing, time to action and time on task because they can you can push all of this activity out within the relationship layer by creating these workspaces as you wish and bringing in your teams and pushing the data out in real time and driving those responses it's completely vacating the the legacy governance regime the old way of doing things you just don't need to conform to those older ways of doing things with digital transformation, such as you just don't. Um, and yes, you're right, it, this this gives actionable insights for everybody, not just procurement, obviously, for your for your SLTs and your C-suites, you see that you're seeing their leadership teams and your C-suites, et cetera, et cetera. You can see exactly where the cadence is in an operation, whether it's coming from you as a customer or where it is within, within your customer organization, or which suppliers, as you can see everything within that, within those relationship layers, where the last updates were, where are the live chats, where are the blockers, you can see it all. So these are very much the cornerstones of the relationship layer. This one is insights, uh, as we mentioned, it's live data. Uh, we don't use static data within the within the within the relationship layer. Um, it's a gift. If you're using static data in digital in a digital platform, you got to ask why. You just shouldn't be. 
um, and, and everything we do is based on live data. Live data is a valuable commodity, ages fast. Um, that it does. And the next one is Omni, which is where we've created this unrivaled, you know, I don't want to make it sound salesy. I'm just, you know, this is the mechanics of four pillars. Um, it's frictionless access for the ecosystem. And this is this is absolutely part of creating the buy-in from your partners because you're giving them ownership. You're bringing them in. You're not you're not um, you're helping them or letting them contribute to the narrative, which is so important because you know a number of customers say this to us. This is the narrative that we want. We don't just want the KPI dashboard as I mentioned at the beginning. We can see when things are red, green, or amber, whatever, or whatever the KPIs are, but we want to understand how we got there. Because that's the value. I mean, I think that's... that's The red flag isn't the value. It's the journey that's the value. That's absolutely correct, right? Your your suppliers and your partners have to be a part of the story. They have have to be a part of of it. They have to own a lot of it. They have to own a lot of it. They're 80% of the revenue. Let them own it. Yeah. Um, And there's actually... I just want to check something... There's actually another one that hasn't gone in there for some reason. The other one is automate. So what oh, we do okay. is it's not in there for some reason. Um, we sorry, I'm flicking back and forwards looking for it. Uh, hasn't gone into the deck for some reason. But the other the, the other main mechanic or feature of the relation of of the relationship layer is called automate, which is where we take all of the everything that you've seen that's going on within the relationship layer, all of the contributions and the feedback and the and everything. Um, and we push it out on a regular basis to the ecosystem because people are busy. They're not, they're not going to go looking for stuff. They're not going to go looking for, for their work. So every week the system pushes out uh, a mini report, and it's all live data, as I said, but it pushes out a mini report on everything, on, on all of your projects uh, that you personally are involved in. So if you've got a whole bunch of work, uh, of, of, of subcategories running within a within a within a supplier environment. There'll be different people involved in each one. So there'll be different messaging going out to different people all over the place on both sides of the ecos, on customer and supplier's side, um, alerting them to uh, deliverables that need updating or that need doing. So it's taken the place of a number of FTEs to keep the plates spinning um, by doing the work for you. Um, and that includes all the KPIs and everything else that lapses as well or as, as they expire. Um, so it takes care of all of this stuff within. It really is a live and dynamic relationship layer um, like nothing we've seen before. It's a true differentiator. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, as it says in the slide, it's pretty much the golden age of supply relationship management. It's really, really come to prominence. It really has. It's interesting um, to think that, you know, five years ago, there weren't head of supplier relationship management roles. Um, yeah. There weren't global SRM leaders that we've had, right? We talked about McKinsey and Hackett and mm. the importance of supplier relationship to our organizations, the importance of defining relationships and, and garnering that. Um, well, I think optimization it's, it, and innovation from our suppliers, right? I think it's existential now, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Well, look at the contracts. I mean, it, you know, if we, I don't have the whole recession conversation, we never know when we're in it or not, whether we're in one or not. But um, the fact is, recession economics, that's definitely around us at the moment. Uh, the, the, the different approaches and responses and treatments from Suppliers and customers alike, they're, you know, customers and suppliers, customers are suppliers and suppliers are customers. Everybody switches roles within the supply chain at some point, right? Or whether you're looking up or downstream, depending on which way you're looking. Um, and so um, recession, recession economics says that if, you know, that, that if business shrinks, business is going to shrink, they're going to buy less. Uh, and if we're working to those contracts, then those margins are going to shrink, which means our business is going to shrink. That's just the way it is. It's natural attrition. Um, the only thing that doesn't shrink are the value targets are still up here. So how do we how do we find them? How do we reach them? We need to collaborate, etc. 
with our partners. Um, so that's that that you know that that's how I would address that particular one, without a doubt. Uh, and also, the value that that. It used to be seen as a nice to have the value from the relationship layer. It's it's almost hard coded now. It's but it's no longer a nice to have. No, it's not. Right? It's, it's not it's a nice a to have requirement that you know we've got the the contract becomes the baseline and the expectation from the business stakeholder is that we're going to get innovation, we're going to get mm. optimization, we're going to get process mapping and all of that stuff yeah. from our suppliers it's hard coded now isn't it it's it's mm -hmm. not a nice to have it's in the it's in our forecasts it's in yeah. our targets yeah that's what we need to make um in order to keep the lights on in order to survive in order to compete you know um so yeah it's a very very different different space um out there which is why srm really has come to prominence this is true this is true so we're coming up at time. I want to give um, our audience an opportunity to throw some questions out to Sheldon um, as a supplier relationship management subject matter expert. If you have any questions around uh, the relationship layer, now is the perfect time to ask. Um, Sheldon is, is very knowledgeable. I've had many, many conversations with him um, about personal relationships and supplier relationships. And um, yes, thank you, Kathy. I was just going to say that um, October 26th is going to be part three of this, uh, of this series around uh, calling our relationships. It's uh, good relationship governance. How do you maintain that cadence uh, and build a great relationship with your suppliers? Um, you Sorry, can... you lost your job during COVID, Karen. As well, yeah, you know, quite a few people that did as well. Um, so if we don't have any questions, Sheldon, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to to uh, to send out to our attendees here? Um, only to say that if anybody wants to grab a copy of the slides, just let us know. I think I think Kathy's dealing with all of that. Um, if anybody wants to get a, 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 a you know, a, a look over the software uh, at the relationship layer, let us know, and we can arrange it. We can arrange a trial or whatever you want. Yeah, please, please uh, take a look at. Oh, what would be your quick formula to define the value proposition of SRM? Ooh, that's a good one. Very Here's nice. A quick formula to define. We've actually, it, it's quite interesting. We actually do that in the platform. Um, to be honest with you, we whether it's a quick formula, um, we look at the cadence uh, and a number of different value points to extrapolate the non, the 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 the, the value that's derived through an engagement. Um, it's it, it, there are so many different ways. How the quick formula to defining it? Wow, um, oh, that's a really good question, actually. See, I'd have to actually show you the, we've, we've got something in the platform, it's called relationship utilization, okay? And what it does, it tracks the levels of cadence across a number of different activities, and it aggregates all of that up into a, into a, a, a value percentage. So it can actually show us where the value is. Um, that would be a very quick formula to uh, establishing the value of SRM. Not the answer you probably want. I'm like, that's what's that one I have. The COVID, the jobs combined, several positions. Oh. It has. Thank you so much, Maria. That's a that's a great, um, that was a great comment. I appreciate it so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Craig, we don't know if we want you Philadelphia Eagles fans <laughs> at the next session. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. We appreciate you uh, joining and listening to us. Look forward to seeing you on October 26th. And, Craig, we absolutely want you at the next uh, and all of our sessions. Absolutely. Be there. <laughs> Here's Craig. Here's David.
Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, See everyone. See you soon.